Man, it's been a while since I made a video. Stupid summer university courses. Maybe I should start working on something, but what do I have here to take a look at? Let's see. Meh. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, uh, forget you saw that. Overdone. Too overrated. <laughs> Too underrated. Mm, maybe later. Oh, hey, Transistor. Yeah, I think I could do something with this. Do you have a game that you really love and will go back to frequently just to re-experience it for whatever reason? Well, for me, that's Transistor. Since first playing it when it came out in 2014, I will regularly go back to Transistor time and time again just to revisit Red and the rest of Cloudbank City, despite the fact I have an ever-growing backlog of games that I have yet to play or finish, and likely never will get to. There's just something about this game, its story and presentation, that just keeps bringing me back, even after playing through it multiple times. I don't know, it just really grabs me, you know? But what is it about this game in particular that makes me like it so much? Well, let's take a look at Transistor and why you need to play it. Before we can really look at Transistor though, I think it's important to first look at the developer behind it, Supergiant Games. Way back in the distant year of 2009, programmers Amir Rao and Gavin Simon had been working at EA's LA Studio, the studio that made the Command & Conquer RTS games during the late 2000s until EA effectively killed the franchise. After working for EA for three years and becoming tired of developing under larger studios, Rao and Simon decided they wanted to make their own studio in order to make the games they wanted to. And so they quit their jobs, moved in together, and started developing what would become their first game, Bastion. And with that, Supergiant Games was born. But while a game can be made with two people, Rao and Simon only really had experience in game design and programming, and needed to hire a few more people to round out their studio talent. So with Rao acting as the game designer and director, with Simon as the main programmer, they also brought on Greg Kasvin, who the two knew from their job at EA, to write Bastion's story, with freelance artist Gen Z as the game's art director, and childhood friend of Rao, Darren Corbin, to compose the music. By bringing all these people on, Supergiant Games had a full team, and development of Bastion could begin in full. Closer to the end of Bastion's development, Andrew Wang was also hired full-time to help with programming and porting the game to multiple systems, and Logan Cunningham was the one to provide the voice of the game's now infamous narrator. Kids worked up quite a thirst by now, so that fountain looks real inviting. Sometimes you just need a drink. And so, after two years of development and game redesigns, this little game company was finally able to release Bastion in 2011 on Steam and Xbox Live Arcade and quickly received mass praise from both gamers and critics. People loved it for its unique way of storytelling, mixing both narration and mise-en-scenes, the beautiful art direction, and stellar soundtrack. It felt like a fresh type of game, especially considering this was at the time of the shooter apocalypse of 2011, where everything being released by AAA Studios was some type of online shooter, and something like Bastion coming from such a small indie team was rather impressive for the time sitting along the likes of indie darlings like Braid and Limbo. For those of you unfamiliar, Bastion tells the story of a small boy in a world that's falling apart after an unexplained calamity occurs, and you need to collect pieces of the Bastion in hopes of fixing it. Exploring this world feels like watching a story unfold, because you literally are. The levels form as you go through them and kill everything you run into, while the stranger narrates the plot as well as exposits about the world itself. And then... He falls to his death. I'm just fooling. Despite the weird visual perspective issues that would occasionally happen due to the isometric viewpoint, Bastion blended both its story and gameplay seamlessly, all the while maintaining the western fantasy theme to its music and art style. Unlike where huge studio games like Assassin's Creed can never be attributed to any one person due to how the development teams are made of 100 plus people, and feel like they're designed by committee because of it, Every part of Bastion can be attributed to an individual, whether it be Rao's level design, Simon's programming, Caspin's writing, Z's art, or Corb's music. And it's all the better for it. The game wouldn't be what it is without all these people's skills coming together, and feels very personal because of it, like someone really wanted to make this thing and not just because the publisher said they had to. <coughs> 
Plus, it's due to Bastion's success that Supergiant Games could start work on their next project, Transistor. Now we get to the whole point of this thing. What is it about Transistor that is so good that I wanted to do an entire video about it? Even though the game's been out for three years and there's a much more relevant Supergiant Games release currently out that I could be talking about if I was quicker at making videos. At first glance, Transistor might not look like much, just a very pretty looking indie game, which it is, but there's a lot more depth to it than meets the eye, from its narrative to its visuals to its gameplay. But before we go too far into that, let's start with the basic premise. Transistor opens on this beautifully rendered piece of art that appears to be just a loading screen while the game starts up. Until you press a button while waiting and the big blue titular transistor currently sitting in someone's chest cavity begins to talk to you. Hey Red, we're not gonna get away with this are we? After this you were then thrown into the story in media res style as Red a club singer in the city of Cloudbank who has lost her voice after being attacked. And once you pull the transistor currently sheathed inside this unknown person, you're left to find out what has happened and why these things called the process are trying to murder you and seemingly consume the city along with everyone else. For some, the beginning of transistor may be confusing, as you're just tossed right into the middle of it without any pretense on who or where you are, or why you should even care. But I think this type of start works for the betterment of the game, at at least from a tonal perspective. The first hour focuses on establishing the tone of the game and letting the player get accustomed to the controls, and doesn't bog you down with a lot of exposition and cutscenes. This is something that Supergiant did with Bastion as well, wanting the exploration to feel much more organic. Before meeting the first boss at the end of the first act, you are given a brief scene slash panoramic art piece to explain what happened to Red and how you got where you were, but the confusion the player has at the beginning and throughout the rest of the game nicely echoes the main characters and their attempt to figure out why this is all happening. In keeping with the neo-noir theme of the game, a lot of the world building and plot is instead conveyed via the Private Eye-esque monologue spoken by the voice trapped in the transistor, provided again by Logan Cunningham. Deserted. Unless you can. Aside from being your only companion throughout the game, the transistor is also your only way of fighting off the process. As you progress through the game, the transistor can absorb data and turn it into functions, each with their own specific abilities, like sending out longer range projectiles, or summoning your own doggo to help you. Functions do go beyond just basic attack abilities though, as they can either be assigned as upgrades to another function, or as a passive buff to Red herself meaning that you can add effects like adding a bounce to a projectile or making your doggo more sturdy, though you are limited by how much memory the transistor has and how many slots you have open, so you have to be smart about how you assign all your functions. Fitting with Rao and Simon's history of designing RTS games, the actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Transistor combines action RPG mechanics with real-time strategy. You see, every enemy encounter is restricted to a set area that you are then stuck in until you beat all the enemies in that section. This restriction is where you have to be more strategic about how you approach these encounters because while you have the means to fight the process, most of your attacks have a very slow and committed windup, and many of the process move on you faster than Twitter on a new meme. So to compensate, there's the turn mechanic, which freezes time so that you can strategize, plan out your attack, and unleash it in one big flurry of effects. While it might not be apparent, this is where the RTS influence comes in, as it shifts the gameplay from a regular hack and slash RPG to a more strategic focus, comparing numbers and finding the best places to lay out attacks for optimum effects. The downside to using turn though is that after you use it, you're left completely open to attacks until the action gauge refills, so there is some method to using it. Basically, either kill everything in that turn, or back down and hide like a coward until you can use your functions again. By approaching gameplay in this way, the game feels much more involved and experimental than Bastion was, as it lets you play around a lot more with how you deal with encounters, and feels like your choices in how you arrange the functions and use them are an active part of your long-term success. A common issue in game design though is that even when the player is given a huge variety of ways to play the game, once the player finds the playstyle or mechanic that can solve every problem and has no limitations to it, it removes the need to try other ways of playing that might be less efficient, unless otherwise forced to, and can make the game boring because of it due to it being repetitive. 
This problem isn't relevant to every game and player, hashtag not all players, but it is common enough that Rao and the other designers at Supergiant Games were thinking about it when making Transistor, and wanted to avoid players from getting too reliant on just using one or two functions, but didn't want to hamper their enjoyment by forcing them to use random skills or actively taking away the ones they wanted to use. With this in mind, the game was originally going to have more of a card focus, similar to something like Magic the Gathering, where the player knows what's in their deck but don't know how they will draw, meaning there would have been a lot of focus on improvisation. Though the designers couldn't get the need to shuffle cards to blend naturally with the linear narrative that had already been written. Instead, with the finished version of Transistor, the designers gave the player 16 different functions in the game to mix and match as they wanted and find different ways to use them. This also proved to be somewhat counterintuitive to the previously mentioned problem though, because if there's no incentive to try new combinations, many players could simply rely on a few of the basic ones all the way through, or spam the ones with the highest damage output relentlessly, making the game into another mediocre action RPG. So two elements were added to the gameplay that are meant to encourage players to try other arrangements of functions. Firstly, when losing all of your health, instead of getting a you died screen, you lose your most upgraded function for a few enemy encounters. This means you have to adapt and try using different functions while the ones you lost cool down. While some prefer familiarity, sticking to the things they know best, the intention of this was for you to try other functions and find creative ways to combine them. You can still have your favorite function that you enjoy powering up for maximum potential, though this can be taken away from you during important fights with bosses or powerful new process, forcing you to try to adapt and figuring out a way to win without them. So it's almost better to have a more well-rounded group of functions that you use and being open to trying new ones. Aside from this, as well as adding in your traditional challenge rooms that give you different combat scenarios, the other way the designers try to get you to use different combinations of functions is to use the game's lore as an added incentive. Basically, each function is the trace data of a citizen of Cloudbank, all the information about their backstory and what they were doing prior to being absorbed into the transistor. A lot of these act as pieces to the overall plot, but they are locked away when you first get them, and the only way to get access to each citizen's complete story is to use their function in the three different ways that you can use them. So, say if you only use Crash as an active function, and never attempt to use it as an upgrade to another one, you will never get Red's completed backstory. Now, this doesn't mean the player has to do anything or use functions they don't want to, and can simply stick with the functions they like best, but it is an added bonus for those willing to try other ways of playing. In finding ways that incentivize experimentation, the designers gave the gameplay a lot of depth that is just asking for exploration, and rewards those players that find clever ways to mix and match. But a game is more than just its gameplay functions. Despite what some may say. Now let's take a look at our style and main character with the transistor Red. Earlier I stated that Red is a club singer who has lost her voice, and I know you're likely thinking being mute puts her into the standard silent protagonist category that is common in games. A lot of the time, a silent protagonist is usually thought of as being a blank slate in the game's narrative, so that they can act as the player's avatar in the story. Which is often the case, though this doesn't mean that a silent protagonist can't be their own character as well. A character doesn't need a voice to have a personality, and can still convey one through their actions or reactions. So despite being mute, Red is not void of her own personality, and in some ways being mute almost highlights it. While you dictate what she does in combat and what she votes for when at certain terminals, a distinct personality does shine through, if only slightly. A lot of Red's characterization comes through in her interactions with the Transistor, and the messages she leaves at terminals throughout Cloudbank. For example, just look at the Transistor's response after they leave Red's apartment. Locked yourself out. How are you gonna... Oh. In seeing all the destruction around her, Red knows that things are likely not going to turn out well in her pursuit for the truth, and is prepared for that outcome. She's given multiple chances to escape from Cloudbank and its deconstruction, but Red isn't willing to lie down or run and hide, especially if it means that the one trapped in the transistor will be stuck there forever. Though despite all the difficulties she struggles through, she still has the ability to hum a little tune.
but the most telling part of Red's personality actually shows through her relationship with the transistor, or more specifically, the one trapped in it. It's a typical thing in stories that the drive of the plot is one character going out to save their bay, or there being a tacit love interest subplot inserted to add emotional depth. Now, don't get me wrong, I have no trouble with the lovey-dovey stuff, but it's interesting that Transistor instead focuses on an already established relationship, and the main thrust of the story is the two of them trying to stay together during this catastrophe. Throughout the game you can tell how much the two genuinely care for each other's well-being, whether it be the Transistor pleading with Red to escape and leave the city rather than get to the bottom of what happened, even if it means he's stuck in the big blue sword, or Red leaving messages on terminals assuring him that she's still there and will find out who is responsible for all this. I mean, she even lovingly holds the transistor after each battle. Like, how cute is that? In how the game presents these two and their connection, it makes you want to get to the end of the game not to beat some final big bad and save the world, but to see what will happen to the two of them. Building up to the bittersweet ending of the story. That may or may not have made me tear up when I first went through it. The journey that is shared between Red and the Transistor while traveling through Cloudbank is almost operatic, considering its themes of relationships, love, and revenge, and especially with how it blends it all together through its music. Much like with Bastion, the music of Transistor is integral to the overall experience of the game. Now, I'm one of those people who typically listens to podcasts or other things when playing games, especially big open world RPGs where exploration and wandering are the main focus, but with Transistor, I will regularly turn everything else off when playing it, because Darren Korb's music is so important to the game's tone and how it tells its story that it's pretty much vital to it. Which isn't by accident. Korb stated in an interview that a main consideration from our point of view with any game is using audio to deepen the immersion and reinforce the atmosphere and tone of the game as best we can. For Corb and the rest of Supergiant Games, music isn't simply dressing on the video game salad, but instead is a main ingredient in the recipe, and is meant to tie everything together. For example, fitting that Red is a club singer, the only time we actually hear her voice is in the songs that are played in the background of the story, and the lyrics of these pieces even convey more of Red's personality if you listen to them carefully. Like with In Circles, the song that plays during the first boss fight with the socialite elite turned process Sybil. The lyrics allude to her and Red's complicated relationship prior to the events of the game, the lengths that Sybil went through to get to the singer, and how Red is going to put the social butterfly out of her misery. While the songs themselves have an almost romantic sound to them, the lyrics show Red's more headstrong nature and her somewhat nihilistic outlook on what's going on. On top of this, the singing itself is phenomenal, with singer Ashley Barrett acting as the voice of Red for these pieces. In terms of style, the genre of music for Transistor is, as Corb calls it, old world electric post rock, and I'm not sure what that means exactly, but the tone of the soundtrack does have this blend of electric rock with classic lounge music that really suits the aesthetic of the game, even becoming warped and muted when Red uses turn and freezes time. And it's that detailed audio mixing that really helps in the immersion of the game. Corba said when talking about designing Transistor's music that he and the rest of the team at Supergiant spent a lot of time prototyping the art and audio to make sure they were of one piece this time. That was our one goal. Bastion, I thought, turned out really nicely, but a goal on this project was to more seamlessly integrate the look and feel of the art with the feel of the audio. And speaking of awkward segues, let's finally look at the art of this thing. If it wasn't clear from my poorly made thumbnails, I'm no artist, but I've always really appreciated games that have a unique art style to them, like Okami's use of Japanese calligraphy, or Hyperlight Drifter's trippy pixel art look. And Transistor is almost in a league of its own when it comes to its hand-painted neo-noir art style. I mean, just look at some of these screens. Cloudbank is this beautifully designed world that incorporates so many different colors, shades, and lighting effects creating this neo-noir Blade Runner look that feels very immersive and suits Corb's music. And even after parts of the city have been consumed by the process, making everything into these egg white colored cubes, it still maintains its visual spectacle due to the use of shading and perspective. Gen Z, the art director for Supergiant Games who we talked about earlier, 
has this amazing painterly style that uses vibrant colors and shading in a very striking way. And you can really see this in how it's incorporated into Transistor, especially any time there's one of these cutaways that are effectively full screen panoramic paintings. Probably one of the biggest benefits to having Transistor as an isometric game is that Z's art doesn't have to be adapted into full 3D models, and everything from the character sprites to the setting maintains her specific hand-painted art style. And because of this, almost every scene in the game looks like this beautifully done piece of concept art that you have the ability to move through. Though, despite all my salivating, Transistor isn't without its faults. While the turn mechanic is very inventive, one issue that you need to learn about when playing it is that it doesn't take into account how enemies will move during your attacks. So you may whiff at times because the attack at the start of the chain moved the position of the process, thus throwing your whole plan out of whack and pretty much voiding the whole point of using turn. Also, this game is not designed for having a lot of moving sprites at one time. It can handle having many sprites in the background and foreground as they're just moving images, but once there's a lot of moving pieces on screen with red, the frame rate takes a major hit, cutting down to 2 to 3 frames per second, and making me think that it was actually going to crash the system. Now it is very uncommon to have a lot of things on the screen at one moment, only happening under very certain circumstances, but it shows that this game wasn't designed with huge battles in mind. Lastly, Transistor is only about 6 to 8 hours long. Being on the short side isn't a bad thing itself, in fact I appreciate that it doesn't stretch itself too far for the sake of length, but this also means that the story is rushed in certain places, and some later characters don't get the time they maybe should considering their story significance. I think it would have been better if the game was an extra hour or two longer, just so that the plot could have been elaborated on more and Red's character could have been developed further than it was. But regardless of its faults, Transistor is still an amazing and unique game that I really wish there was more of. It's clear that everyone at Supergiant Games are incredibly passionate about their craft, and it shows through pretty much every aspect of this game. All of these things that I've spent the last 20 minutes gushing over make Transistor something that I think people should really check out, hence the point of this video. And it might not be for everyone, but for those of you that this is for, you will likely really love it. And remember, when everything changes, nothing changes. Anyway, thanks for listening to me ramble for so long, it's much appreciated. And apologies for the drought of content on this channel. As I alluded to earlier, summer university has kept me fairly busy. But I do have some things planned for videos in the very near future, so keep an eye out for new stuff. If you want to keep up to date on that and make sure you don't miss it, you can always subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you want to see more right now, you can check out some of my older videos here, like why you need to play Nier Automata, or my DMC series retrospective. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.